A History of the Gold Coast and Ashanti, from the Earliest Times to the Commencement of the 20th Century, by W. Walton Claridge, Senior Medical Officer, West African Medical Staff, Gold Coast, with an introduction by Sir Hugh Clifford, KCMG. Introduction Since the manuscript of Dr. Claridge's monumental History of the Gold Coast and Ashanti first came into my hands in the summer of 1915, its publication in suitable form has been to me a matter of keen personal interest. It is not often that one of our crown colonies has the good fortune to number among the officials serving in it a man who possesses so many of the qualities that go to the making of a really good historian. Diligence in research, meticulous accuracy, a capacity for marshalling facts, the nice sense of proportion which allots to each question or incident its full, but no more than its due place in the general picture, a strongly critical habit of mind, and a thorough command of appropriate language. The exercise of all these together with years of patient but enthusiastic labour, have been devoted to the production of the present work, and Dr. Claridge has thereby rendered to the colony with which he has long been connected a service of conspicuous value. In the past, too, it has not infrequently happened that when labour of this description has been performed by a servant of government during his not overabundant leisure, the result of his toil has been suffered to reach the public either at his own expense or under the auspices of some learned body, whose imprimatur is apt to have upon the general reader an effect comparable to that which scarecrows are piously supposed to exercise upon the fowls of the air. In the present instance, however, the government of the Gold Coast has succeeded in saving the author and his work from such unmerited obscurity, though with its characteristic vacillating caution, of which so many notable instances are to be found recorded in the pages of Dr. Claridge's book, it has been careful to dissociate itself from any implied endorsement of the opinions expressed in these volumes. It is in every way right that this work, which is now presented to the public under the guarantee of the House of Murray, should be placed in a position to make its appeal to readers in every part of the empire, for it deserves the attention of all who are interested in the history of the overseas possessions of Great Britain, of which it forms an unusually striking and instructive chapter. It illustrates with peculiar force the curiously haphazard fashion in which many of our tropical colonies have come into being, the manner in which so often the flag has followed trade rather than trade the flag, and the frequency with which extension of control and jurisdiction has been gradually and reluctantly accepted not as the result of an insatiable appetite for power and dominion, but in the first instance, as the only practical, practicable means whereby peaceful commerce could be assured, and later, because a newly awakened sense of responsibility toward the native races forbade continued toleration of savage and barbarous practices. It reveals, among other things, the ugly fact that the path to the establishment of a durable peace in semi-civilized communities is almost invariably paved with the victims of a series of devastating little wars, and it shows how immeasurably the difficulty of avoiding such happenings is increased by an imperfect understanding of the character, the polity, and the outlook upon life of the peoples with whom, in tropical lands, Great Britain has had to deal. I have not included an absolutely unbiased judgment among Dr. Claridge's qualities as an historian, for, 
as is the case with most Englishmen who have come into close contact with the Ashantis, the admiration excited by the courage and the many manly and chivalrous characteristics of this warlike people has engendered in him so strong an affection for them that he cannot invariably view all the incidents in their history with complete and dispassionate impartiality. But such bias as he from time to time shows is a generous bias and lends to this book, in my opinion, a very special value. It is well that our national actions should be examined as much as possible from the standpoint of those who were affected by them, and no intelligent reader can rise from the perusal of these pages without being conscious that their author has conveyed to him a deeper and truer appreciation of the peoples of the Gold Coast and Ashanti than has, in the past, been any way common or without feeling that his sympathy with them has thereby been notably enlarged and quickened. The records of a colony, the earliest beginnings of which had their inception in the dark days of the slave trade, cannot but hold many things that modern Englishmen must recall with mingled shame and horror. The reader will find much to deplore in the public and private acts of many of the white men who, in their time, made history on the coast. And some deeds were done which must forever remain among the most bitter and humiliating memories of every Britisher who loves his country and is jealous of its fair fame. For these, Dr. Claridge has done well to offer neither palliation nor excuse. On the other hand, it is at least open to argument that he has on occasion been somewhat harsh in the verdicts which he passes upon the policy of the government and upon the actions of its servants. The historian is necessarily in the position of one who is wise after the event, but the large bird's eye view which he is enabled to take was not at the service of any save very exceptional men among those who were the contemporaries of the events which he records. This must be borne in mind, for exceptional men are rare at all times and in all places, and few indeed found their way to the west coast of Africa. Due allowance, therefore, must be made for the imperfect appreciation which many public servants showed of the situations with which they were confronted, and for the bewildering ignorance of the people with whom they were dealing, by which they were so frequently hampered. Today, most thinking men will readily subscribe to the opinion that the only justification for the presence of Great Britain in West Africa, and for the control which we exercise over its inhabitants, abides in our ability to govern the country in a manner more conducive to the common good and happiness, and with a higher regard to the rights and well-being of the weak and inarticulate masses, than would be possible to the natives themselves if left to their own devices. This theory, however, had not the remotest connection with the objects for the attainment of which the first European settlements were established on the coast. And though Englishmen began trading with the natives of the Gold Coast as long ago as 1553, the publication of Dr. Claridge's history celebrates the centenary of the earliest tentative attempts of a British governor to improve the lot of the people or to save the weak from the oppression of the strong. For many decades after 1815, however, the maintenance of uninterrupted trade routes to and from the interior represented the highest ambition of the British government on the coast, and it was in order to secure this object that little by little jurisdiction was extended and an increasingly active part was taken in intertribal politics. Even after the national conscience had been sufficiently awakened to bring about the abolition of the slave trade, the commercial interests of the British traders continued to be the principal preoccupation of the authorities on the coast, 
and the assumption of responsibility for the welfare of the natives, whose world our coming had turned topsy-turvy, was shirked and evaded as much as possible. There can be no reasonable doubt that if the British had not interfered, the Ashantis would have extended their empire over all the nations of the Gold Coast. But our disapproval of their invasions was due, in the beginning, not so much to any feeling of pity for their victims, as to resentment at the disturbance to the trade which they occasioned. Thus the role of protector of the defenceless was more or less inexorably thrust upon us in the interests of our own commerce. But once accepted, it can never again be wholly discarded, and thereafter our main object was to keep tribal warfare within some sort of bounds, and to shore up, as best we could, the tottering prosperity of the countries which the aggressive energy of the Ashantis was perpetually assailing. After the characteristic fashion of our nation, we tried to accomplish this with the expenditure of as few men and as little money as possible, and a policy of hopeless vacillation and inconsistency of course resulted. Such a policy, equally of course, was quite unintelligible to the natives with whom we were dealing and the Ashantis, at any rate, never knew what to expect of us, which was only natural, seeing that we were living, so to speak, from hand to mouth, and never knew from year to year what to expect of ourselves. Looking backward from the standpoint we occupy today, it is clearly to be seen that anything resembling a permanent friendly alliance between a British administration on the coast and an independent kingdom of Ashanti was unthinkable, having regard to the incompatible ideals and the wholly divergent views on a number of vital matters entertained by the two governments. It may be that modern civilization is the lion and that barbarism is the lamb but the two cannot nowadays lie down side by side. No colonial administration of our time, for instance, could long have maintained an alliance with the power which regarded human sacrifice as an essential religious right. And the records of West Africa show, beyond dispute, that the abolition of such practices can only gradually be effected even in localities where Great Britain exercises full executive authority. A colonial government, which in the beginning battened on the slave trade, was itself, according to modern notions, in a condition of semi-barbarism from which it had to emerge ever the assumption of responsibility for the regulation of the habits and customs of its native neighbours could be recognised by it in the light of an imperative duty. The white men of bygone generations, therefore, whose aim was commercial expansion, not the moral improvement of the Africans, whose own standards of civilization were still in some respects rudimentary and who regarded a friendly Ashanti as the surest means of securing the ends they had in view, cannot fairly be blamed for having failed to foresee that their ideals would fall far short of the demands of those who would come after them. Thus the history of British relations with the peoples of the Gold Coast and Ashanti, rightly viewed, is the story of an attempt to secure our merchants' profits at the least possible cost to ourselves and the gradual assumption of extended responsibilities undertaken in pursuance of that object. To a much later phase belongs the practical annexation of the whole country, a step which was forced upon us not by any alteration in the habits and practices of its inhabitants, but by a change which, in the course of years, had been wrought in ourselves and in our conceptions of the moral obligations which our presence in their midst imposed upon us. The passing away of an empire, which had risen to great power through the warlike genius of its rulers and people, cannot but occasion some sentimental regrets, and the dissolution of the kingdom of Ashanti like the destruction of the great military organization which Shaka created in Zululand, 
seems to curtail the already dwindling domain of modern romance. No one, however, can find serious reason for doubting that the people of Ashanti today, who devote their energies to the cultivation of their food plots and cocoa gardens, and to the improvement of their towns, are not only a more useful, but on the whole a happier set of people than were their blood-stained ancestors, who spent a goodly portion of their time in ravaging their neighbours' homesteads, taking other people's lives and enslaving their womenkind and their children. The contrary point of view, which much more accurately represented the truth when it was written nearly 15 years ago than it does now, is ably set forth in the quotation from a dispatch by Sir Matthew Nathan, which will be found on page 440 of the second volume of this book. The dragging across the face of any primitive country of Jagannathkar, in which is born aloft the great idol we name Pax Britannica, entails the demolition of many romantic things. It necessitates the substitution of the commonplace for the exotic, the tameness and safety of ordered modern life for the excitement and the perils of primordial existence, and the drab of everyday wear for the highly coloured hues of barbaric display. Incidentally, however, it affords to the individual human being, the average man who in the past was at best a successful looter and at the worst mere food for powder, an opportunity to live his own life in peace and quietude, and in a manner chosen by himself. It once fell to my lot to bear the tidings of an outbreak of war through the villages of a country whose people were famous for their bellicose and bloodthirsty reputation. The men wore grave faces as they looked to their weapons and patiently resigned themselves to the inevitable but the wailing of the women still sounds in my ears. Kings and chiefs, on the other hand, stood to lose much and to gain little or nothing by the establishment of a lasting peace and a well-regulated administration, for it has usually been the peculiar privilege of the great ones of the earth to thrive at the expense of their subjects and to combine the excitements of war with a comparative immunity from its dangers. It is not possible, however, to legislate for a minority, but experience would seem to show that it is a mistake to suppose that the average man of any race who has tasted war in real earnest has thereafter an overpowering love of it. It is to be regretted that Dr. Claridge has not seen his way to carry on his record of the history of the Gold Coast and Ashanti beyond the dawn of the present century, for whereas the story that he has to tell relates to the almost in uninterrupted wars and disturbances which culminated in the final campaign of the British against the Ashanti in 1900, it is during the past decade especially that the fruits of the peace which was then established with so much difficulty, have been made manifest. Even now, the potentialities of the Gold Coast and its dependencies have only begun to be fully appreciated, and the phenomenal prosperity of its people is the growth of the past few years. Never, until quite recently, have the natives of the Gold Coast and Ashanti been afforded an opportunity of developing their ancestral property in peace and security, free from the fear that the accumulation of wealth might excite the cupidity and invite the unwelcome attentions of some powerful neighbour? Little more than a dozen years have elapsed since this possibility dawned upon the bulk of the population. Yet today, the Gold Coast and Ashanti alike are inhabited by a sturdy race of peasant propriet proprietors who, among other things, produce annually more than a fifth of the total cocoa crop of the world. 
British energy and the careful management of the financial resources of the country are beginning to overcome the appalling transport difficulties by which West Africa is still shackled. The development of the gold mining industry is due to British capital, enterprise and science. But the enormous agricultural expansion of the last 10 years, which has revolutionised the conditions of life on the Gold Coast and in Ashanti, is the work of the natives themselves. It has, of course, been aided and stimulated by the government, but no one can doubt that a people who have so promptly and eagerly availed themselves of the chances placed within their reach can look forward with confidence to a future marked by increasingly creditable achievements. And though, alas, the mistakes which the British have committed in the past in their dealings with the peoples of the Gold Coast and Ashanti have been both grave and numerous, and though the Africans' instinctive suspicion of the white man has all too frequently been justified, the essential soundness of the relations which in our time subsist between ourselves and the native population has recently emerged triumphant from a very searching test. When the Great War broke out in August 1914, the military forces of the Gold Coast invaded Togoland, the adjoining German colony, in the interior of which had been erected a huge wireless installation of immense strategic value. In less than four weeks, the Germans had been compelled to surrender, and there can be little doubt that the knowledge that Whereas the natives of the Gold Coast were doing all in their power to aid us, the natives of Togoland had everywhere welcomed us as their deliverers, helped them to the conclusion that their position was desperate. A month later, it was found possible to dispatch to Douala to aid in the campaign of the Allies in the German Cameroons. Nearly all the men of the Gold Coast Regiment of the West African Frontier Force who were not required for the occupation of the conquered territory. The denudation of the colony and of Ashanti of practically all the troops which, in time of peace, are ordinarily maintained in them, was rendered possible by the enthusiastic loyalty to the British throne and to the government which was manifested from end to end of the country. As an additional proof of the sincerity of this feeling, subscriptions to the Patriotic Fund, initiated by the natives and mainly received from native contributors amounting to over £25,000, were rapidly collected and placed in my hands for transmission to the Secretary of State. It is pleasant to recall that at this time of national crisis, the chiefs and people of Ashanti displayed as keen a desire to assist and support the government as any that was shown by their neighbours on the coast. There is one subject upon which I feel constrained to break a lance with Dr. Claridge. His book will tend, I fear, to confirm the popular belief that the climate of the Gold Coast is one of the deadliest in the tropics. I regard this opinion as at once unsound and unscientific. Speaking as a man who has spent more than 30 years in tropical lands, east and west, I regard it as an axiomatic proposition that the climate in any part of the heat belt is strongly inimical to the health of Europeans. It cannot be otherwise than enervating to be in a constant state of perspiration, and those whose skins are not provided with wide open pores really suffer more than do men who possess this healthy but inconvenient equipment. As tropical climates go, however, that of the Gold Coast is at once less hot and less damp than those which are to be found in many other parts of the world. This is not a question of opinion, but of fact proved beyond dispute by the readings of the thermometer and the rain uh, gauge. And no one who has lived both in the Gold Coast and in, say, the low country of Ceylon, in the Malay Peninsula or archipelago, in Cochin China or in Cambodia, can entertain a doubt on the subject. 
Yet it is an incontrovertible truth that the ravages wrought in the health of Europeans, and especially in that of newly arrived Europeans, by a sojourn in the Gold Coast, have, from time to time, been greater than any which are recorded in the localities above enumerated. This is to be accounted for not by the climate which, as I have said, is merciful, as tropical climates go, but by the virulence of the insect and water-borne microbes which have their home in West Africa. It will perhaps be said, if the result is in either case lethal, it does not greatly signify whether sickness or death is induced by the climate or by microbes, but the fallacy of this will be recognised when it is remembered that though mankind has not yet obtained a mastery over climatic conditions, a successful war against microbes is something well within our power. Were the climate of the Gold Coast the primary cause of disease, we should be unable to effect in it even a slight improvement. But if, as has now been proved to be the case, infection is conveyed by the bites of certain insects or the drinking of impure water, it will at once be realised that preventive measures are m much more nearly within our reach. As it is, however, it is neither more nor less accurate or logical to blame the climate for cases of yellow fever, malaria, or dysentery than it would be to uh, hold the climatic conditions of India accountable for the injuries which a man had sustained in an encounter with a Bengal tiger. In each case, the person affected has fallen a victim to the onslaughts of the local fauna, which chanced to require a tropical climate for their comfort and well-being. Accordingly, if, in the light of the knowledge we today possess concerning the causation of tropical diseases, we were to analyse the statistics quoted on page 165 of the second volume of Dr. Claridge's history, which show the casualties from sickness among the Europeans engaged in Lord Wolseley's march to Kumasi in 1874, we should have to admit that on the face of them, they constitute no specially damaging case against the climate of the Gold Coast. We should ask, for instance, how many of those invalided had dispensed with the use of a mosquito net, and how many had drunk water which had not previously been boiled and filtered. In other words, we should eliminate all cases of avoidable tropical disease, such as yellow fever, malaria and dysentery, and when this had been done, it would be found that a surprisingly small residue remained to be laid at the door of the climate. For the invisible and aggressive organisms of the Gold Coast, to whose assaults the death and illness of Europeans in that country are almost entirely to be ascribed, I do not desire to be understood as holding any sort of brief. It is true that mosquitoes are here far less numerous and persecuting than they are in many other countries, the Malay Peninsula, for instance, but that renders them all the more dangerous. When these insects swarm in myriads, as they did on the Perak River in Malaya or in Georgetown, British Guiana, a comparatively small percentage of them are usually infected, and an elementary desire to avoid being eaten alive compels even the most careless of Europeans to protect himself from them. In the Gold Coast, a man may easily be tempted to pass the night outside his net for the sake of coolness, and the mosquitoes will not usually be sufficiently numerous to break his sleep, yet the bite of one of them may compass his undoing. The attack is, therefore, more insidious in the Gold Coast than it is in other tropical countries, and it is also far more virulent. The malarial mosquito is here neither more nor less dangerous than his fellow in Malaya or Ceylon or elsewhere in the tropical zone, which means that he is a pretty deadly enemy to Europeans. 
but it is only of very recent years that it has been recognised and admitted that yellow fever, which is conveyed by the bite of the common house mosquito, is endemic in West Africa. Here long it will probably be a generally accepted theory that the west coast is the original habitat of the as yet unidentified organism which, passing from the mosquito into the blood of a human being, causes this disease. And that it was from across the Atlantic that it was imported into the West Indies and South and Central America with the cargoes of slaves, some of whom carried the infection in their veins. The extraordinary uh, virulence of yellow fever when it first appeared in those countries would seem to indicate that the germs were let loose among a population which had never acquired any measure of hereditary immunity from them, or which, in the case of the descendants of the African slaves, had lost that immunity. Similarly, it has now been ascertained that though the CC fly, which is the bearer of the germ of sleeping sickness, is found distributed throughout wide areas in tropical Africa, the disease in an endemic form has for centuries been famil familiarly known to the natives of Ashanti and many other parts of the west coast, where it annually claims a few, but only a very few victims. Of recent years, however, the opening up of transcontinental communication between the seaboards of the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, which has been affected by Europeans, has caused sleeping sickness germs to be imported into localities where the sea sea fly abounds, but has hitherto been innocuous. In these places, the native populations had had no opportunity of acquiring a hereditary immunity, such as is enjoyed by the natives of, say, parts of Ashanti, and in consequence the people of Uganda, to cite a single instance, have died of the disease in very large numbers. The position, then, is that West Africa, while enjoying what for the tropics is quite a good climate, has the misfortune to be the chosen home of a variety of dangerous living organisms which are peculiarly deadly to Europeans and are much less easy to cope with than man-eating tigers or other more demonstrative beasts of prey. The recognition of this fact was and is the first step towards effecting an improvement. The destruction of the breeding places of mosquitoes, the segregation of Europeans at night, with the object of minimising the chance of attack upon them by infected mosquitoes the avoidance of exposure to mosquito bites by the use of nets and other artificial contrivances, the judicious use of quinine when such exposure is inevitable, the provision, where possible, of pipe-borne water supplies, and the boiling and filtration of all drinking water, these are today precautions which are regarded as a mere matter of common sense which no one of any intelligence would willingly neglect while living in West Africa. Little more than a score of years has elapsed, however, since the necessity for many of these things first dawned upon Europeans in the tropics, but the result is already to be seen in the enormous improvement in the death and invalidating, uh, invalidating sorry, rates. An immense deal, of course, still remains to be done, for one cannot deal with a country of the size and population of the Gold Coast and its dependencies, as the Americans have dealt with the narrow strip of territory through which the Panama Canal has been delved. The complete extirpation of disease-carrying insects, which has there, to all intents and purposes, been effected, is something altogether removed from the regions of tropical things where vast areas are in question, but it is not a task beyond the ability of the sanitary expert notably to reduce the chances of infection and to work a material improvement in the health conditions of particular localities. Every year this is being progressively affected in the Gold Coast, and it is time, I suggest, 
that the old encrusted superstition ain't uh, the climate should be discarded once and for all. It is all very well to give a dog a bad name and hang him, but it is hardly fair to go on hanging him after it has been conclusively proved that it was the cat that robbed the larder. For the rest, I have none but the warmest admiration to express for Dr. Claridge's handling of his subject, for the long and patient labour which he has devoted to it, and for the success which that labour has achieved. The people of the Gold Coast and the Shanty have reason to be grateful to him, for he has recounted the history of their country and their forebears in a manner which should cause it to be widely read throughout the English-speaking world. And if a knowledge and understanding of a country's past is, as I believe it to be, essential to those who serve it in the present, and have to some extent a hand in the moulding of its future, then the toil and study which have gone to the making of this book will bear fruit in West Africa not only for men of the present generation, but those of generations yet unborn. Hugh Clifford, Clandogo, Monmouthshire, August 17th, 1915.